Hey there, everybody. Uh, it is June 2022, which means it is time for the grand finale to the debate season NSDA Nationals. It is the oldest, biggest, and most prestigious speech and debate tournament in the world, and the resolution is, in my opinion, a pretty great one. Resolve radicalism is preferable to incrementalism to achieve social justice. Um, if you're watching this, that means you have either qualified to NSDA Nationals, or maybe you're just interested in learning more about the topic to improve for next year. But either way, congratulations. That is fantastic. And thank the debate gods, this one is gonna actually be in person. For many of you, this will be your first in-person NSDA Nationals. I really envy those of you seeing it for the first time because from like the registration all the way to the finals, there's really nothing like NSDA in terms of scale and scope. I was lucky enough to slide in as an alternate my freshman year. And it was really like one of the single biggest inspirational experiences for me to try to get good at speech and debate. Uh, and, and hey, for what it's worth, I will actually be there again this time in Louisville, judging LD. My son, Ben, qualified in Lincoln Douglas. My other son, Sam, made it in big questions. So we are loading up the crossover vehicle and making the trip to Kentucky uh, very soon. It has been a super busy June for me, so I wasn't planning on doing NSDA specific videos, but given that we'd already done a bunch of work with Ben researching this topic, I thought, hey, you know, why not put together maybe a somewhat shorter video that kind of hits some of the major strategic issues in case any of y'all thought it might be useful. So this is a slightly less comprehensive treatment uh, than, than covering every aspect of the topic. It's more like, hey, here are some ideas and angles that uh, maybe not everybody has thought about and might help you kind of polish up your cases and your blocks and your strategy going into nationals. Uh, also do, please feel free uh, if you're at nationals to find Ben or Sam uh, and make fun of them because their dad is the debate guy on YouTube. I would really enjoy it if you did that. But anyway, because you are all the best of the best and because my schedule is really full trying to help prep two kids and doing my regular job and everything else, we're going to use a slightly different format for this video than what we've used before. Uh, and that's going to be like a top 10 tips format. So rather than walk through every single part of the case, we're going to hit the highlights and focus on more strategic issues and arguments that I think will help set you apart maybe from some other folks at this massive competitive tournament. As always, if it's helpful to you, maybe like, maybe subscribe, maybe tell a friend. And as always, the sources we cite and the timestamps will be in the description below. So without further ado, let's get started with tip number one. Okay, so tip number one is know how NSGA Nationals works. Now the rest of these tips are gonna be pretty resolution specific, of course, but I thought I would start with one quick set of pointers that really everybody needs to know. So for most people at NSDA Nationals, this will be your first time. And almost certainly it will be your first time in person. And if that's you, the most important thing is to not get overwhelmed by it because it will be very likely, almost certainly the biggest tournament you've ever been to. And part of being successful is knowing what to expect. Uh, no matter what a typical debate tournament means for you, NSCA is different, right? Uh, that it's not so different that it needs to be intimidating. So let's just walk through some of the basic features so that you are not caught by surprise. So first, there's the judging pool. Uh, NSDA historically has had a mix of what feels like, and this is just my personal estimate, about one half experienced traditional judges, one quarter more progressive, maybe national circuit experienced judges, and then one quarter like relatively layperson parent judges who don't have a lot of experience. That's a rough estimate, but that's definitely what it feels like when you talk to debaters, when you go to nationals, when you read the ballots. So that's gonna mean a couple of things. First, if you do a faster and more technical style of LD, you're gonna to have to adapt to a more rhetorical, traditional audience. It doesn't mean you dumb the arguments down, it just means you explain them clearly in plain English at a moderate speed. Remember, your more technically oriented judges know that they're at NSDA. They know what this tournament is and they know that you have to adapt to the preferences of the rest of the judge pool. So they're not gonna penalize you for a style that's more inclusive of everybody in the judging pool. But your more traditional judges, they very well may penalize you for arguments that they can't follow or understand due to speed or jargon or like weird theory. So as a general matter, it's pretty clear who you need to be catering to in terms of your style, right? So on that note, I would strongly suggest that you write cases that avoid things like, for example, highly specific advocacies that don't affirm or negate the resolution as a whole. Like, for example, if you look at some of the commercial briefs written on this topic that you can buy online, they're suggesting these really specific cases on things like uh, prison abolition 
or eco-terrorism, or like Democrats winning the 2022 midterms. And if this were like the Tournament of Champions or Harvard, you know, I'd say those narrow cases are pretty great because the judges there are very likely to be preconditioned to accept certain norms and stock arguments that allow for very specific advocacies. For what it's worth, I'm not sure that's a good thing because I think those norms create barriers to entry to debate, but that's another issue for another day. At NSDA, though, many of your judges are going to be very sympathetic to the idea that these highly specific cases don't meet the basic burden of like addressing the resolution as it's worded, right? And for many of them who are not your more technical judges, it would be a major uphill battle to win some sort of theory argument, right, as to why that's not an automatic loss for you, particularly on the app. So in my mind, the best approach is to just go ahead and write the strongest, highest impact cases you can, so long as they can be translated into clear, plain English, affirm or negate the entire resolution, and they don't ask the judge to sort of step out into these esoteric worlds of like critiques and deep theory that kind of make up the rules of debate. Obviously, of course, you can use specific examples for impacts, like midterms, defunding the police, whatever you want, but they need to be examples that link back to a case that basically weighs radicalism as a concept versus incrementalism as a concept in some general way. And by the way, if you want a sense of what NSDA Nationals debating looks like, there are, of course, plenty of final rounds and even some non-final rounds you can watch on YouTube and in other places. Now, I will say that the finals tend to be even more layperson friendly than your typical NSDA round uh, because the judging pool in finals often includes, you know, dignitaries from like sponsoring organizations and corporations and stuff. So you shouldn't expect all rounds to be quite this focused on like speaking and style or to go quite as slowly as the finals, but still the finals and certainly the other rounds provide a decent picture of the overall vibe at NSDA. We will link to a couple of them. And if you haven't watched any of them, I would strongly recommend that you do that. A really important resource is, is that NSDA also asks all judges for a fairly specific judge paradigm and for preferences on really specific stuff like speed, the importance of the criterion, and other things like that. It is super detailed, and it's already up on Tab Room right now. So, for example, here's mine. Here's most of mine. Here's what I could fit on the screen, right? And as you can see... You can find out a lot of details here, more than any tournament I've ever seen. And I can tell you that judges love being adapted to. When you tailor your delivery and your approach to what a judge tells you they want, they feel respected and valued, and not like they're just a target that you're aiming your words at. So given that you have such a trove of information here, I would suggest as soon as your postings go up and you know who your judges are, you delve into your judge profiles and make some notes about how to come at each round. And before you walk in, into the round, you know, take a second to review those, think about them, and prepare to give the judges what they have asked you for. Because if you don't, and your opponent does, and it's an even remotely close round, which it will be because everybody's good at NSDA, right? Then your opponent's probably going to win that ballot. Judges will find a way in their mind and on their flow to justify that outcome. They almost always do. That's just how the real world works. One last point on this is that uh, the logistics of the tournament are important. You have six prelim rounds, which is pretty normal, with two judges each. So there is no winner of the round per se. There's just the winner of the 12 total ballots. Now, in the past, NSDA has set eight of 12 ballots as the cutoff to break two elimination rounds, to break to round seven and eight. So you're just trying to win individual ballots, right? In elimination rounds, it's double down and out. In other words, just like at, at your qualifying tournament, very likely, you lose twice and you're out. And you stay in until you lose twice. And, and typically, the finals is going to be something like something insane, like round 15 or some extreme number like that. My only advice on the structure of the tournament is just to pace yourself. It's a long, long tournament. So bring water, bring energy bars, have a like calm down and focus kind of playlist on your phone if you can. Uh, don't think ahead too much, right? When you're in prelims, focus on getting you know one or two ballots at a time in every round and don't worry about the elimination rounds. If you make it to the elimination rounds, don't worry about like how far am I from making the stage for awards. Don't worry about whether you have a down or not. Just keep on an even keel and think only about giving your best performance in the next round that's in front of you and you will do great. And remember, there are a million ways to win at NSDA. So now some people won't be happy unless they're the national champion, but that's not an ideal attitude because of just how much luck that takes, even if you're really, really, really good, right? Just making it here and certainly just making it to the first elimination cut is a huge accomplishment it's a great resume item for college so just remember there's plenty of opportunity to prove yourself to succeed to win access
accolades and to improve as a debater, regardless of where you finish up in the rankings. Okay, so tip number two is on a vague resolution, clear framing is key. This is a topic where investing in clear, logical, well-sourced framing is going to pay big dividends because we are debating some very, very abstract concepts here. We are not debating specific policy proposals like intellectual property protections for medicine. We're not even debating fairly general subject matter like outer space appropriation. Instead, we are looking at what may well be the broadest LD resolution I have ever seen in like 25 years which pits one general approach to social change anywhere in the world against another general approach to social change also anywhere in the world and asks which one works better to achieve a fairly vaguely defined target of social justice. Um, this is a challenge, right? Because most judges generally prefer to make pretty narrow, well-defined choices between concrete options, as opposed to like making broad, loose judgments about vague concepts. Why? Well, first, it's easier to do. And second, it's easier on your conscience, because if you're given a well-defined choice as a judge, it feels less like you're intervening in the round and more like you're letting the debaters decide it. You're just sort of like calling balls and strikes like an umpire. And that's what most debate judges would rather be doing if they can. So what that means is that debaters who invest time in grabbing hold of the framework and giving judges a clear, concrete choice are going to have a big, big advantage over debaters who just come in and kind of start talking generally about like radicalism, incrementalism, and social justice. And we're going to spend a lot of time later talking about exactly how to do this on both sides. But you do it through definitions, values, and criteria, and substantive arguments. You build your entire case around what hopefully is a fairly simple, straightforward question with a clear answer. Uh, for now, though, let me just give you a couple of quick examples of how this might play out, okay? So, uh, for example, if I come in as the affirmative and I don't define preferable, and I just talk about how radicalism is generally good, right? And my opponent comes in and they just talk about how incrementalism is generally good and radicalism is bad. Well, what exactly does the judge do with that? How do they weigh two things where their usefulness really depends on the context without any context? What do they do? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They just kind of make it up, right? Whatever they happen to be thinking, maybe what they saw in the last round, maybe what they read in a brief if they're the coach, just whatever springs to mind, they start doing a lot of the work for you when the round is vague. And in those cases, it's more likely that the ballot is going to become something like a 50-50 coin flip. And if you want to win 8 out of 12 to go on to ELIM rounds or keep winning in ELIMs, you can't accept 50-50, right? No, but what if instead, right, you come in and you define preferable as meaning something specific and concrete? Like, just for example, which priority should we be focused on right now in the year 2022? And then you follow up that framing with an argument about how radicalism serves to chart the course or draw the map toward the big goals that we as a society need to achieve and how we can't use incrementalism to achieve those big goals before we have radicalism draw us the map, right? And then how right now in 2022, the country and the world are adrift and they don't have clear goals for achieving justice. And thus, what is preferable, what is essential right now is to use radicalism to chart the course toward meaningful justice. And then later we can use either radicalism or maybe incrementalism to actually achieve it. Now, this argument took a little time to set up, right? It took some definitions, probably a solid criterion, and then some contentions that fed into the definition. But if you invested that time, you gave the judge a much easier question to answer. What do we need to do right now is the question, Judge. Well, we need to draw a map for social change and social justice. Which of your two options is better at drawing the map toward social justice? Radicalism is better because incrementalism lacks any long-term vision. It's just about compromising and taking whatever you can get. Now, that's just one example. There are dozens of different ways to do it. But the point is clear. If your case is just generic value, generic definitions, generic contentions about why radicalism or incrementalism is generically good, right? You are in a weaker position than if you start with a clear, concrete framing of what the resolution is asking, and then you build your case around that. Because at the end of the day, this resolution is really about taking an impossibly broad topic and taking the initiative through framing to give the judge a clear question that they can realistically answer after a 40-minute debate round. 
Okay, so tip number three is that strategic definitions are essential. Uh, let's get a little bit more specific now about how we frame the resolution. In the interest of time, we're not going to cover every single word or talk about values and criteria. Instead, I want to focus on the definitions of four key terms in the resolution. Radicalism, incrementalism, social justice, and preferable, because I think these represent the most critical points for debaters to sort of try to take control of the narrative in the round. So first, radicalism. Well, Webster defines radicalism like this, as you can see. We're talking about something that is very different from the usual or traditional or favoring extreme changes in existing views, habits, conditions, and institutions. So first, notice that what we're talking about here is not defined by ideology. Radicalism does not necessarily refer to progressive or like left-leaning causes. Instead, what it's about is how far you diverge from the typical or traditional views in any direction. Uh, and this dictionary definition is pretty consistent with what you see in the academic literature. For example, the Michigan State University American Radicalism Collection defines radicalism this way. Uh, radicalism, the beliefs or actions of individuals, groups, or organizations who advocate for thorough or complete social and or political reform to achieve an alternative vision of American society. So in short, if you are far from the norm or the median in terms of the policies that you favor, the values that you favor, or how you believe we should try to change those policies or values, then you have radical beliefs. It doesn't matter whether you're advocating for abolishing private property or like completely defunding the police on one side, or like for establishing a Catholic theocracy or repealing all civil rights laws on the other hand. Either way, you are a radical. Now, this is potentially problematic for the AF because if the judge believes they're signing a ballot for undifferentiated radicalism that can include like race reparations on the one hand, all the way to skinhead neo-Nazis on the other, well, that's not a super compelling sales pitch. I think that one pretty intuitive and strong way for the AF to get around this is to argue that the resolution, by referring to social justice, assumes that we are only talking about forms of radicalism that plausibly seek to achieve something that we'd all agree is just. In other words, since the resolution specifies the aim of social justice, the only variations of radicalism or incrementalism that are topical are those that have that particular aim. Now in a second, we'll talk about how social justice is pretty vague and a pretty malleable term, but if we assume for now that we can win the idea that social justice refers to generally fair and progressive outcomes, then things like neo-Nazis and ethnic separatists would be ruled out by the terms of the resolution itself. And I think that's a point AF wants to have in their back pocket in case NEG tries to argue that like radicalism can cut in the direction of like radically regressive policies, right? One more thing on radicalism, be careful in most cases not to conflate it with radicalization. There's a ton of literature out there about the process of radicalization. In other words, turning someone into an extremist or possibly even like a terrorist. And academic definitions of the word radicalization do tend to focus on shifting a person or a group toward violence. And on the neg, it might be tempting to use this kind of definition and just say that, well, if radicalism, if radicalization means turning someone into a radical and it involves violence, then radicalism must mean violence too. And we will actually look at a few cards later that might allow you to do that. Candidly, I will say it looks like radicalization is really its own term of art. In other words, it's a term that is taken on a more specific meaning in the relevant literature. It really seems to focus heavily on violence and terrorism to the point that it is a separate concept from the general idea of radicalism, which is more focused on just like non-mainstream beliefs. Th that said, could you see some negatives try to sort of stretch the definitions and make some arguments that contend that radicalism leads to violence? Yes, and we absolutely will look at those later. Is it the strongest interpretation? Probably not, but you need to make sure you have it on your radar. So next, let's look at incrementalism. So in my view, there are two basic ways to come at incrementalism. One is definitely preferable to the other, particularly for the negative. So the first approach is the simple literal approach. And for this, you can again look to the dictionary definition at Webster, which says that incrementalism is a policy or advocacy of a policy, a political or social change by degrees. So under this view, incrementalism is really just sort of go slow, right? Make changes slowly, little by little, rather than fast and all at once. If you're the AF, you're definitely okay with this, right? Because it means incrementalism is just solving problems slowly. And you're going to say that our problems like economic inequality, systemic racism, homophobia, whatever, are urgent and we can't wait for decades to solve them. So AF really likes rounds where incrementalism is defined this way. 
But there are much more nuanced definitions of incrementalism as a political theory that explain why we might want to move more gradually. And I think the negative is definitely going to prefer these. So a great summary of incrementalism as a political science theory comes from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And it just says that incrementalism is a theory of public policy making according to which policies result from a process of interaction and mutual adaptation among a multiplicity of actors advocating different values representing different interests and possessing different information. And the article explains that incrementalism is a very specific theory, like social contract theory or critical theory, that came from a specific political scientist named Charles Lindblom in the 1950s. And it was basically a response to what was called irrationalism, which is just the belief that policymakers should look at all the options, apply reason, do some kind of utilitarian analysis, and just pick the best one and implement it. And what Lindblom said in his theory of incrementalism was, what are you talking about? That's not how anything works in the real world. It's not just pure rational assessment of all possible options. In the real world, there are strongly opposed entrenched interests. There is a lack of information on the effects that a policy might have. There is governmental paralysis and gridlock. And given those real world facts, the best way to proceed is to make smaller, less dramatic changes that are incrementally better than the status quo in ways that the entrenched interests can accept. In other words, we take baby steps because neither side will allow anything more than a baby step at a particular time. And then we see if the step is agreeable, and if it is, then we take another baby step. So for example, if we look at the problems with racial bias and policing, a radical solution like defund the police, which we'll talk about later, is a bad way to address that because we're just not going to get rid of the police entirely. That is, and look at me on this because I really want everybody to understand, that is never going to happen, right? And as we'll talk about later, the more you say radical stuff like defund the police that polls at like 15% public support on a good day, the less reasonable you sound to most voters who will actually decide policy. And the more your opponents are able to sort of paint you as a nut, right? And the less actual influence you have to do good in the world. Now, on the other hand, the incrementalist says what could actually happen here is we might say eliminate qualified immunity for police officers. We might increase the criminal penalties for police violence. We might ban chokeholds. We might invest more in social workers to help police de-escalate situations. Incrementalism says let's take the progress we can actually get rather than making these bold symbolic stands that make us feel all self-righteous and virtuous but end up accomplishing nothing or worse leading to a public backlash and moving us backwards. In other words, incrementalism recognizes that when you demand all or nothing, you usually get nothing. Lindblom's theory is a strong framing of incrementalism for the neg because it emphasizes that incrementalism is not just like laziness or foot dragging or compromise. Instead, it's an almost inevitable reflection of the fact that here in the real world, Different people have very different views of what is socially just, and everyone is reluctant to take big risks, especially if they go against their political dispositions. So with that, we move to social justice. Now, right off the bat on this, there's obviously tremendous ongoing debate as to what social justice means. And if you want an absolutely great one-stop shop summarizing a bunch of different theories of social justice, like utilitarian social justice, libertarian social justice, Marxist social justice, Rawlsian social justice, there is this piece by Gunnar on in 2017. We don't have time to summarize all of these, but if you're interested in maybe trying to go all in on a more specific, less predictable version of social justice, or maybe if you just want to be prepared for these different permutations that you might see, this is a great place to start on that. Now, in addition to all these different theories of social justice, there's also the critique that social justice as a concept is meaningless. And this is summed up very nicely in this piece by Adam Martin, who writes that the basic critique of the idea of social justice as being incoherent comes from the economist F.A. Hayek back in the 1970s. And basically what Hayek said, right, was that to say that something is just, you have to have a rational actor who's either behaving justly or unjustly. And society as a whole is not a rational actor. It's really more like the weather or just like sort of an accident of nature. So the idea of saying that a society as a whole is just or unjust doesn't make sense because it's not making conscious decisions, right? I will say that today, though, in the decades since Hayek wrote that, the concept of social justice has, by consensus, been accepted as a rational, identifiable, defensible idea with a definite meaning. And it basically means a set of values whereby everybody in society, not just the privileged, have their rights and interests protected. 
So, for example, Webster defines social justice as a state or doctrine of egalitarianism. Uh, the Collins Dictionary defines it as the principle that all members of society have equal rights and opportunities. Uh, there's a very good article in Investopedia on what it means, and it basically emphasizes that social justice is distinguished from regular justice because it focuses more on just relations among groups within society as opposed to the justice of individual conduct or justice for individuals. And that's a good point, right? Social justice uh, is more about broad outcomes affecting groups, especially marginalized groups, than it is about, say, a specific trial or a specific proceeding. And I think that the concept of social justice has been around long enough and judges are going to be intuitively familiar enough with it that if you try to deconstruct it and just say, like, there's no such thing, that's going to be a real uphill battle. Plus, like, what does that even get you, right? The resolution isn't asking us whether social justice is good. It just asks us, you know, which, uh, which option does a better job of getting there, right? Lastly, we have preferable. Uh, rather than just give you a definition of the word preferable, let me make one observation on how it might strategically affect the round, okay? There is a pretty stock negative argument on many debate resolutions that generically compare the value of two things, and it goes like this. It makes no sense to prefer X over Y when both X and Y are necessary to achieve a good outcome. So we should reject the resolution, not because X is bad, but because preferring X over Y is counterproductive or maybe even meaningless. Now, when you apply this stock argument here, what it says is the negative doesn't argue that radicalism is inherently bad or that incrementalism is always the right solution. Instead, the neg argues that the resolution asking us to generically prefer one over the other makes no sense because they are both necessary tools in our toolbox for social progress, right? Radicalism uh, helps us identify name and publicize major injustices, and it helps us create these big ambitious plans to solve them. But radicalism has a really hard time actually getting policies passed, and it can be really risky in an uncertain world. That's where incrementalism comes in. Incrementalism recognizes that if society were ready to implement all those big ambitious plans right now all at once, well, they would already have been implemented. But there are major barriers, right? There are mountains to be crossed, and we can't just leap over them in one go. So incrementalism looks for the step-by-step -step gains that we can make gradually in the real world to slowly cross the mountains and move us closer to good, maybe radical changes. And that's why if you talk with most policymakers and experts who've actually worked in the real world of like legislation and social and economic change, they will tell you, of course I believe in big, bold changes, but we have to work within the system that exists, with the voters that actually exist, and we have to make gains where we can, when we can. So in other words, radicalism and incrementalism are two tools in our toolbox of social change. And the negative says it's literally nonsensical to prefer one over the other, which is what the AF must advocate for. Without both tools, the project can never get done. If you try to build a house or repair a car or put together a piece of furniture with like just a screwdriver and not a wrench or not a hammer, you'll never get the job done. Or alternatively, to put it a different way, uh, it makes no sense to prefer a car's steering wheel over its tires. If you don't have both, the car is going nowhere. So my main point on the term prefer is to consider and, and at least be aware of the argument that because the resolution asks us to endorse this kind of nonsense preference that prevents any real social progress, we should reject it. That's the next position. Not because radicalism is bad, but because preferring it in this case is just a fundamentally nonsensical way to conceive of the relationship between the two necessary tools of radicalism and incrementalism. So that's what I've got on definitions. That was a long one, I know. The rest are, are considerably shorter. So let's move on to tip number four. Okay, so tip number five is give some thought to who exactly is making the choice here. And, and what I mean is think about the question of preferable in what context. The resolution doesn't specify an actor and it doesn't provide any context for when or under what circumstances the judge is making the choice between radicalism and incrementalism. And for most people, that context really matters on an intuitive level. Let me give you an example. So say you're an elected legislator and you have to cast the deciding vote on a bill that will accomplish, say, 70% of your policy goals and provide major help to millions of marginalized people. Uh, should you vote to pass it or should you take a more radical hardline stance that anything less than 100% is unacceptable? 
Well, most people, not all, but most, would say you should take the more incremental approach and pass it because that's your job. Your job is to help people now, right? On the other hand, let's say you're an activist and you're laying out your agenda for social change like on social media or at a protest. Should you advance a more radical vision that you think fully solves the problem or should you just limit yourself to marginal changes that might pass right now? Well, most people, not all, but most, would say that you as an activist should go all in with the more radical approach because that's your job. Your job is to try to chart a course toward long-term wholesale change. Or hey, maybe we're not talking about a specific type of person at all. Maybe we're just talking about which approach all of society should collectively take, except that doesn't really make sense on a logical level. If everyone in society agreed with a radical proposal, then it would by definition not be radical anymore. It would be mainstream. So because of how complicated this is, I think one thing that both sides will want to do is make some argument, some framing argument, observation or something, or at least have something prepared about the context in which the decision between radicalism and incrementalism is being made. Who here is deciding whether to be a radical or an incrementalist? Is this about what the average person should do? Is it about what the government or legislators should do? Is it about what the literal judges in the round should do, like in their lives or using their ballots as a symbol? Who knows, right? But ultimately, as a judge, and by the way, I literally am a judge at this tournament, I'm going to have a much easier time marking the ballot for an affirmative that says something like, for example, this debate is about what kinds of positions a typical person in society should support, radical or incremental. Should a regular working class parent or a regular college student or a regular teacher vote, advocate for, and support wholesale change needed to fix injustices or just half measures? That is something I can wrap my brain around, right? Whereas the broad clash of these vague ideologies is not. It's like two clouds of mist just passing through each other. And I, as the judge, am going to be doing a lot of the work for you, making a lot of assumptions if that's the case. You're going to lose control of the round and cede it to me, which you don't want to do. So help me out. Think about who the actor is and what context the actor is making the decision and explain it to me and argue about why your framing of that choice is just. Help me make a much simpler decision that's more about your arguments and less about like my guesses and my mental predisposition on the topic. Okay, so tip number five is be prepared to argue why great or terrible people or movements are either radicals or incrementalists. So at the other end of the spectrum from the sort of high level framing we've been talking about, I also think both sides need to be prepared to debate ground level practical examples. At a tournament like NSDA on a topic as vague as this, a lot of the impacts on a lot of the ballots are going to come down to concrete illustrations. Arguments like, for example, the, the black civil rights movement in the United States was a fundamentally radical movement. If we want change like that, we must prefer radicalism. Or alternatively, no, Martin Luther King was a far more incremental uh, figure than people like Malcolm X and was far more successful at achieving lasting change. In other words, linking the ephemeral philosophy here to important impacts that actually happened in the real world. So we know going in that most, if not all debaters are gonna be trying to link to a pretty well settled list of major figures and social justice movements around the world. Just looking backward, you know, Dr. King and the civil rights movement, Malcolm X, Gandhi, the Stonewall riots for LGBTQ equality and the LGBTQ civil rights movement generally, trans rights today, things like campaigns for gun control, campaigns to establish social welfare programs like the National Health Service in the UK. This is nearly inevitable in every round because it is the only realistic way to link to real world impacts, right? So if your opponent on the AF is linking radicalism to say, LGBTQ equality in the United States, what is the most basic attack you want to be able to level against that case? Well, I would suggest that it's basically what you would call a link turn in technical debate parlance. It's saying, hold on, you've got it exactly backwards. The success of the campaign for LGBTQ rights in the U.S. is an example of incrementalism, not an example of radicalism. 
if, if it's the black civil rights movement and the neg is saying that all the gains were incremental, AF wants to be able to say, are you kidding me? All of Dr. King's ideas were considered radical at the time. And the incremental policy stuff only came after some of the most radical protests in our country's history. In other words, I, I think it's important and one of the best, most efficient uses of time to prepare for this topic for you, along with any teammate or coach that you can get to help you to basically maybe put together like a simple chart of all your major like individual leaders and movements that pushed for any kind of social change, civil rights, economic equality, whatever, right? And basically almost literally take two columns, right? Uh, and, and in each one, like in one put a bullet pointed list for why that person or movement was basically radical. And in the other, put a bullet pointed list of why they were basically incremental. Now, this is not gonna be possible for everyone, right? It's pretty hard to argue, for example, that you know Malcolm X was not a radical. But because change in the real world happens with a mixture of radicalism and incrementalism, for most examples, you really can make a viable argument about why they fit predominantly on one side or the other of the ledger. And this will give you several advantages in the round, I think. First, it's going to give you a built-in attack at the impact level on a lot of contentions. In other words, you're going to de-link or even turn the impact, right, uh, as they say. Second, it will make you seem far more conversant and interesting and smart in rebuttals and cross-examination, right? So instead of just droning on about this abstract philosophical stuff, which is gonna be very easy to do on this topic, you're gonna be saying stuff like asking in cross-examination. So can you give me an example of how radicalism has achieved this thing you're talking about? And they'll say, uh, sure, the American Civil Rights Movement. And then you can say, hold on, wasn't the American Civil Rights Movement a multi decade process didn't it succeed by taking small gains in areas like school integration and voting where it could rather than trying to wipe out systemic racism all at once right and i'll be honest with you you know at a, an extremely long tournament where the judges are judging like double flighted rounds for two or three days minimum, being able to speak in these concrete terms and say, okay, my opponent wants to talk about, for example, you know, uh, the LGBTQ rights movement or the movement for workers' rights in the United States. Let's talk about whether that actually was incremental or radical. That's just way more interesting and way more concrete and way easier to listen to and vote for than a bunch of long block quotes and vague philosophical theory. Okay, so tip number six, uh, for the affirmative, compromising with injustice can never be just. Uh, this is our first point targeted at the AF specifically. So as a general theme, I think it's pretty clear that most AF debaters are going to want to push the debate as far toward like idealism as possible because radicalism is really all about idealism. While negative debaters are gonna to wanna to play like the sober realist and the pragmatist, right? But one key advantage that the AF has in this basic fight, right, is the resolution specifying social justice as the target that we're trying to hit. It is not pure utilitarianism. It is not some marginal increase in welfare that we're after or just some marginal decrease in inequality. Those things are nice. They're desirable, sure, the AF would say, but they are not justice or social justice. So I think one major theme that the AF can seize on here is that you never achieve justice by compromising with injustice. If a person is put on trial for murder, there is strong evidence that they're not guilty, right? It is not justice to say, well, okay, let's compromise, right? Let's be incrementalists. Instead of life in prison, we'll just sentence you to five years. Now, that might be a deal that you or I would take depending on like the risk, right? That's how the plea bargain system works, for example, which arguably is a really bad system. But that is not justice under any meaningful definition of that term. And I will be honest with you, I can imagine a smart, rhetorically skilled affirmative, knowing what they're getting into at NSDA, getting up in a rebuttal and saying something like this. If you want to argue that black and brown people seeing somewhat less police brutality is an acceptable compromise, fine. Call it an acceptable compromise. If you want to argue that Native Americans getting some compensation for the genocide perpetrated against them is a less bad alternative, fine. Call it a less bad alternative. If you want to argue that LGBTQ couples getting married but then having their kids go to schools where they can't say gay because of the laws that are being implemented, if you want to argue that that is the best we can do right now, fine. Call it the best we can do right now. But don't call it justice because that's not what that word means. 
That is a powerful intuitive argument that basically is an end run around all of the utilitarian arguments from the negative. Well, look at all the stuff that incrementalism has gotten us, right? The argument is, yeah, it's gotten us some stuff. It's gotten us some measurable increases in quality of life, but it's still not justice. And moreover, it's not just that incrementalism doesn't affirmatively achieve justice. There's a strong argument that if achieving social justice, like the word achieve means achieve, like it means actually arriving at a point of fairness and equity for all people, incrementalism actively undermines that by turning it into a competition to see which groups can gain favor and by normalizing the marginalization of those groups that are left out. So James Donovan in 2001 writes, the rationale behind the adoption of incrementalism is that if civil liberties cannot be extended to all simultaneously, we will at least make sure they are given to us now. This immediate parochialism, even if shamefully self-centered, is not politically irrational if at worst it delays but does not deny other groups the same privileges. But the inclusion of a new group on the list, and he means the list of folks who make it in under incrementalism, right, detrimentally impacts those left behind beyond mere inability to enjoy the new protection. Eric Hines offers a good example. He argues that the failure to include sexual orientation within the United Nations human rights agenda results not merely in the exclusion of sexual orientation, but a further mystification of it, which in turn is used to justify its continued exclusion. If the list of groups against whom it is illegal to discriminate is long, the inference can be drawn that discrimination against unlisted groups is thereby acceptable. So the argument here is that if we we incrementally pick and choose who gets certain rights or which rights get recognized, we implicitly send the message to people in society that the people or the rights that weren't included on the list are legitimately viewed as unjustified or as being outsiders. And it can also split up broad coalitions that are needed to achieve those just outcomes. So these are two very solid strategies for arguing that whatever utilitarian practical gains we get under incrementalism, they, they involve a compromise and that compromising with injustice is never a way of achieving justice. Okay, so tip number seven is that the affirmative should emphasize that incrementalism just doesn't actually work very well. This is related to the last point, but it goes farther by talking about the core problems with how incrementalism works. And the basic idea is that it really doesn't work very well in practice. Neg is very likely to argue that incrementalism for all its flaws and all its compromises is good at getting the job done. And your response is the AF should be no, it's actually not. Now, there are tons of different ways to argue that incrementalism doesn't work, but here are some of the ones that I really like. First, there's the idea that incrementalism can't achieve justice because it has no direction at all. Incrementalism is just sort of like an amoeba that kind of grows out in whatever direction is open or like a plant that grows toward wherever the sunlight is. Well, that can be good or bad, but it is essentially random, right? Justice cannot be random. Justice has to be designed intentionally intentionally, and it has to be based on some coherent standard, as we said earlier, that applies fairly to everyone. Radicalism can give us that. It may not always give us that, but it is at least capable of giving us that. Incrementalism can never give us a design system that is fair to everyone. All it can do, at best, is maybe sort of rearrange the order of like who is most advantaged or disadvantaged at any given time. And there's a really great example of this argument from James Donovan, who we cited earlier in his 2001 article called Baby Steps or One Fell Swoop, The Incremental Extension of Rights is Not a Defensible Strategy. Again, mentioned it briefly earlier, this is a fantastic article with a ton of great cards, mainly focusing on social justice and civil rights and the LGBTQ rights movement. Uh, and I'd suggest reading the whole thing. But for purposes of this argument, what Donovan says is this. While incrementalism accurately describes historical processes, it has no foundation as a deliberate strategy. In other words, although in retrospect incremental progress may be achieved, it should never be the goal from the outset. And he goes on to explain that incremental progress may have some practical benefits, but it's not justice because it doesn't begin with any overarching conception of justice. It just does a piecemeal approach where we move like one group up in the hierarchy and then and maybe we bump another group ahead of them, and then maybe we move another group down. And he explains it this way. 
We are precluded from enforcing economic equality at a stroke due to our democratic system. So we tinker with different bits of the population, hoping to affect that same outcome. But the end result of all that piecemeal tinkering has not been to bring us any closer to the real goal of an across the board improvement. Glazer explains this is not because the individual programs have been ineffective. On the contrary, they may be taken to be doing the jobs for which they were designed. He finds instead that the social programs have had a dynamic impact, which creates new classes of poor that take up the bottom position as those assisted by social programs rise out of poverty. The piecemeal approach to economic inequality has not changed the overall distribution of income, but only altered the characteristics of those at the bottom of the ladder. The list of those groups economically benefited grows even as new groups are added to the ranks of the poor. Like a bump in a rug, to correct the problem in one spot only causes it to arise in another. If the goal was to get rid of the bump in that particular spot, the strategy has been effective. But if the intent was to correct the overall bumpiness of the rug, it has been and will continue to be a failure. Bumpiness must be rectified wholesale by relaying the rug or not at all. Incrementalism will not render the same result. Now, that's the, that's the basic argument that social justice requires a coherent system based around a universally applicable standard, and incrementalism doesn't work that way. All it does is move marginalized folks up or down in the hierarchy over time. And yes, the overall conditions may get a little bit better, but the hierarchy still exists. The unfairness still exists. The inequitability in the distribution still exists. And until we tear out the hierarchy entirely, the hierarchy based on race, sex, religion, in sexual orientation, economic privilege, we will not live in a just society, right? We will just maybe live in a slightly less bad, unjust society. And that's the basic argument against being able to achieve social justice through incrementalism. Second, there's the argument that incrementalism isn't even really possible anymore on a practical level. It just doesn't work in the current political climate. This is from Dr. Robert Lifsit of the University of Oklahoma writing on why the compromises that allowed incrementalism to function just don't happen anymore. And he writes, the attraction of incrementalism was through bipartisanship, durable policy achievements could be realized. Yet the traditional means of achieving bipartisan support for a bill through compromise is effectively dead. Killed not just by partisanship, but on climate change by the very refusal of Republicans to acknowledge the existence of the issue. The era of seeking bipartisan compromise and slowly making positive changes in an effort to address the challenges we face appears over. The cost of failing to achieve significant reform on climate change and civil rights, just to name two, are steep and increasing. And of course, there are a lot of examples here intuitively, right? There are examples of how Congress is more gridlocked than ever and less able to pass compromise legislation, how legislatures are basically full of these cynical partisan entertainers who exist to rile up their supporters on social media as part of a culture war rather than passing good policies. If you look at pretty much any given issue, gun violence, police violence, income inequality, climate change, you name it, we can't pass anything of substance to address it in the United States at least. This also happens in other countries, but it's extremely pronounced in the U.S. We are paralyzed to even try to address the big systemic problems that afflict us, right? So the only real virtue of incrementalism was that you get part of what you want rather than nothing. And the argument would be, look, if we are no longer getting part of what we want, if we're usually getting nothing and all of the big systemic problems remain, right, then what possible reason could there be to settle for less in the demands we make? If the odds are really bad either way, if we are so gridlocked that nothing is getting done on these issues, you might as well go all in and demand a total solution through radicalism. What do you have to lose, right? The term we use in debate is try or die, right? A 1% long shot chance to fix the problem is better than a conservative incremental effort that isn't enough even if it succeeds and is also doomed to fail because there's no compromise going on at all, right? And then the third approach to this would be if we look at the resolution on a global level, there is literally no way for incrementalism to achieve social justice because it requires massive reallocation of resources from the global rich to the global poor and there's literally no mechanism in existence by which that can happen incrementally, right? And by the way, as an aside, the app should absolutely insist that we approach the resolution on a global level. If we're talking about social justice, but like only social justice for the poor and marginalized in rich countries who are comparatively much better off in the global poor, that not only doesn't achieve social justice, it arguably makes a mockery of the whole idea, which is all about fairness and equity. 
Now, I'm not going to pull the sources for you on this, but there is endless data about how the worst injustices in the world are the massive wealth inequalities between rich and poor countries, which leads to like massive disparities in like life expectancy and quality of life and education and everything else. And it would take massive redistribution of wealth from rich countries to the point that you and I and everybody else in the United States would be considerably poorer to really fix that. It would take the U.S. dramatically, like, for example, cutting its industrial output, closing down highways to cars, and doing draconian things to lower our carbon emissions, which hurt vulnerable countries more than they hurt us. And there would have to be countless other major reductions in our quality of life to even begin to level the playing field between all the advantages we have and all the disadvantages that the global poor have. Well, what is the incremental process by which Americans are going to agree to living standards that are much, much lower uh, to even things up globally. There isn't one. It's never going to happen. The only possible way to even begin to approach the huge looming problem of global wealth inequality would be to have radical wholesale changes. Are they likely to happen? No, but they are not literally impossible. And under the incremental approach, they are literally impossible. So the impact would be basically on the biggest injustice in the world, which is global wealth inequality. Radicalism gives you a chance, but incrementalism gives you no chance. Tip number eight is on the negative, you need to make the affirmative defend all forms of radicalism, not just the kind that nice progressive judges at NSDA probably sympathize with. Right. So this is our first point aimed specifically at the negative. The affirmative on this resolution is going to want to focus heavily on forms of radicalism that are sympathetic to the judging pool. And by that, I mean college educated people who are connected with the debate community and probably tend to skew a little bit left leaning, but not always, and certainly not radically left leaning in most cases. And as we discussed earlier, that means App would love to talk about things like Black Lives Matter, uh, the civil rights movement, the LGBTQ rights movement, people fighting income inequality, people fighting climate change, stuff that your standard, somewhat progressive debate judge will probably see and think, yeah, we want more of that, right? The NEG does not want to concede that the round takes place on that ground. It wants to put AF on its heels and make it wrestle with other non-progressive forms of radicalism that not only don't achieve social justice, but actively undermine it. So what types of radicalism are we talking about? Well, if you want a great working list, take a look at the Southern Poverty Law Center's Extremist Files, which is a great website listing extremist ideologies, hate groups, and extremist individuals operating in the United States. They include everything from comic book villain level groups like the uh, Westboro Baptist Church, uh, which is virulently anti-LGBTQ, to more accepted groups like American Renaissance, which SPLC says promotes pseudoscience, showing the inferiority allegedly of non-whites. And the Family Research Council, which is also radically anti-LGBTQ, but puts a less incendiary, more faith-based face on it. And there are literally hundreds of others to pick from. And the ascendancy of these regressive, potentially hateful forms of radicalism in the U.S. in particular shouldn't be very hard to see, right? I mean, for goodness sake, just 18 months ago, we watched thousands of right-wing radicals literally storm our nation's Capitol building to try to prevent the certification of the election of Joe Biden based on lies, in large part because they thought he would be more sympathetic to what they considered like woke social justice type causes. That's what radicalism is right now in America and in many other countries as well which have skewed toward right-wing authoritarianism and religious nationalism. And you can be certain that groups from Al-Qaeda to Boko Haram to the Lord's Resistance Army all view themselves as sort of radical promoters of their own vision of social justice. Now, the strategic way to make this argument in the round, I think, is not by using like a super broad definition of social justice that says, well, it's just whatever you think it is. If you're on the neg, I think you should actually agree or even affirmatively argue that social justice does have a specific meaning that includes things like fighting systemic racism, sexism, and homophobia. It means things like religious tolerance. It means more fair wealth redistribution. You should affirmatively take the position that social justice has this specific content. But then you can argue two things right? First, judge. Once you commit to the principle of radicalism in the resolution, you don't get to pick and choose the kind of radicalism you want or get. When you sign your ballot endorsing radicalism, you're going to get more of the kinds of radicalism that actually exist in the real world. In other words, the whole nature of radicalism is that we, you know, sensible mainstream people don't get to control what it does or what it says. The resolution does not have a sub menu for you, judge, where you can check off the kinds of radicalism you want and the kinds you don't. 
But second, on a more practical level, you say to the judge, even if you think your ballot is only directly voting for like socially just radicalism, there is abundant evidence that radicalism on one side of the political spectrum, the side that you may think is good, spurs the growth of counter radicalism on the other side. This is the idea of mutual radicalization and there's a good bit of research on it. So uh, F.M. Mogadam, I'm probably saying that wrong, in 2018 wrote a piece called Mutual Radicalization, How Groups and Nations Divide each, Drive Each Other to Extremes. And he says, mutual radicalization occurs when two groups take increasingly extreme positions opposing one another, reacting against real or imagined threats, moving further and further apart in points of view, mobilizing their resources to launch attacks, and finally attempting to weaken or destroy the other. A typical outcome of this mutual radicalization is pathological hatred, in which each side prioritizes your pain my gain and interprets a loss for the other side as a gain for itself with the destruction of the other bringing maximum self-satisfaction. Mogadam explains that this process leads to outcomes in which only the worst, most radical ideas win the war of attrition. For example, he talks about the, uh, the war between the Reds and the Whites, the Bolsheviks and the anti-Bolsheviks in Russia from 1917 through 20, 1923. And he talks about how they basically drove each other apart right, by, by mutual radicalization. Um, this leaves you in a situation, he says, where you become stuck in oppositional ruts, continually misperceiving, misinterpreting, and distrusting one another, and subsequently basing their actions on highly distorted images and communications. And of course, we can see endless examples of this in the United States and really everywhere else. Every radical group that's on side X cites the growth and the success of the radical ideas of groups on side Y as the justification for why they are radical, right? They use the other side in recruiting and fundraising and social media. Now, at the most extreme level, what this can lead to is radicalism in the sense of like violence or even terrorism. In other words, the more radicalized society gets, the more we spin out of control into a polarized world, the more likely we are to see violent extremism. To make that argument, as we said earlier, you would need some strong evidence uh, that radicalism is a precursor to violence. Now, they're certainly not interchangeable. All radicals absolutely are not violent, but one can lead to the other, and there absolutely is evidence that that happens. So this is from Omer Taspinar in 2009, talking about how radicalism is essentially a necessary precondition for a person or group to move toward violent extremism or terrorism. And he writes, fighting radicalism rather than terrorism provides a better paradigm and framework for a number of reasons. No matter how diverse the causes, motivations, and ideologies behind terrorism, all attempts at premeditated violence against civilians share the traits of violent radicalism. All terrorists, by definition, are radicals. Since radicalism is often a precursor to terrorism, focusing on radicalism amounts to preventing terrorism at an earlier stage before it is too late for non-coercive measures. Well, that's a really, really strong statement. A similarly blunt statement comes from Brian Jenkins at the Rand Corporation this year in 2022. He says that armed conflicts fuel plagues. Until very recently, disease killed more people in wars than battle, but plagues can also fuel conflict, and COVID-19 may be no exception. The conditions facing the United States today are reminiscent of those that got, gave rise to the radicalism of the 1970s and could once again lead to political violence, including terrorism. Now, admittedly, as we said earlier, there is a distinction in most of the literature between radicalization and radicalism, but not everybody's going to be prepared to respond to that. And if your opponent isn't, and you can force them to defend that a vote for radicalism is a vote to endorse a key ingredient of terrorism, that's a pretty good position for the neg. Now, if you want to look for a more moderate but still impactful illustration of mutual radicalization, you might look to something like critical race theory, right? Critical race theory is, at least in some of its forms, a fairly radical school of thought because it rejects the old view that we just need to stop acting in an overtly racist manner and try to get along, and instead it argues that the U.S. and other societies are intrinsically on some level racist and that racist institutions need to either be rooted out or radically reformed. Okay, okay so fair enough right? Pretty radical view. So what has critical race theory actually produced in American society? Well, it has made some gains in the direction it, it wants to make, right? It's, it's taught in universities. Sometimes it's taught in high schools. It comes up a lot in competitive debate. And occasionally it even makes its way into real world policy debates, although that is pretty occasional, right? But on the other hand, it has become a lightning rod for radicals on the other side to try to build support for their extremely conservative reactionary policies. Just about every red state legislature in the country has specifically cited critical race theory to pass 
or at least consider a bill banning the teaching of the idea of systemic racism in schools, right? Well, that's bad, right? That's, that's, that's a backlash, right? Radical conservative politicians like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and Matt Gaetz, they all bang the critical race theory drum to generate donations and build support for their radical ideas. And there are good summaries of how this all happened from Brookings and from Autumn Arnett, and we'll link to them if you want to read more about this specific example. But the takeaway is this general principle of mutual radicalization is true with just about anything that could be considered radical. So like, you know, Bernie Sanders is a socialist. Lots of progressives in this country describe themselves as socialists. This is considered kind of radical in the United States. So what happens? Well, right-wing groups use socialism as the boogeyman to elect more radical right-wing legislators who basically label everything they don't like as socialism to scare their constituents. Now, this isn't blaming critical race theory or socialism at all. It's just saying, as the Mogadam article succinctly told us, when one side radicalizes, the other side almost inevitably will too. You very, very rarely see a scenario where one side escalates their rhetoric to the point of radicalism and the other side just sits back and says, okay, fine, we'll stay moderate. So when you vote for radicalism, Judge, as the preferred tool, you are going to get more of the actual radicalism that exists in the real world, not the cherry-picked radicalism that you want to achieve justice. In other words, you know, if the resolution said fire is a better tool than water, fair enough, you don't get to just decide we're going to talk about campfires and leave out forest fires or building fires, right? So in the end, the story that the neg is telling is that real world radicalism is a mix of pro and anti social justice positions that at best may lead to a zero sum game. Although if you actually look at the types of radicalism that seem to be succeeding in passing laws and making gains, at least in, in the United United States right now, you could make a pretty strong argument that it's the anti-social justice radicalism that's really winning in most cases, and that is a very strong story for the neg to be able to tell. So tip number nine is uh, the negative wants to emphasize just how badly wrong radicalism can go. So when we talk about how radicalism encompasses bad ideologies, that's all part of a larger strategy of emphasizing that you cannot just play defense when you're on the negative. If you go in and your basic pitch is the neg is that incrementalism is fine, there's nothing wrong with it, it's justified in some philosophical sense, and your opponent on the app is breathing fire about how we have this grossly unjust world and there's this urgency that we have to act now, well, you're going to have a rough time, right? So in addition to emphasizing that radicalism encompasses bad causes, there also are strong arguments about how radical causes, even those that most people people would say are like generally laudable in their purpose can go very badly wrong. And to me, I think the NEG should consider having a substantial portion of its case be about how radicalism can go totally off the rails and produce absolute disasters up to and including mass death in the millions. If your opponent on the app is going to have like systemic racism and homophobia and economic equality in their bag of major impacts, you have to have something that can match up with that. And luckily you do. If radicalism means massive immediate departure from the status quo to completely reshape the world, well, guess what, Neg? You get to line up every bloody revolution in history, both successful and failed, every disastrous wholesale policy change, and if you're clever, every like regressive reactionary radical movement, line them all up and put them in front of the judge and say, look at all this carnage. Look at all this destruction that radicalism has caused. In fact, the biggest problem on this argument, honestly, is just where to begin. So, hey, why don't we start with, say, communism, right? Now, I'm not talking about socialism here. That's a totally different thing. That's just an economic system. We're talking about actual top-down state-controlled communist regimes that originated mainly in the 20th century. If you look to Encyclopedia Britannica, they tell you that this is pretty radical. Communism is a political and economic doctrine that aims to replace private property and a profit-based economy with public ownership and communal control of at least the major means of production and the natural resources. It also notes that Karl Marx, the founding father of communism, believed that, quote, 
armed with revolutionary class consciousness, the proletariat will seize the major means of production, along with the institutions of state power, police courts, prisons, and so on, and establish a socialist state that Marx called the revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. So this is basically the definition of radicalism. Communists came to power generally through violent revolutions like in Russia and China and countless other places. They completely rewrote the rules of society, stripping the wealthy of their property, redistributing it, making radical new rules governing the economy, ideology and religion, speech, education, and literally every other aspect of life. Right. So what were the results of this radicalism? Well, I'm so glad you asked. As you can imagine, it's a very politicized subject, so you have to be careful with the evidence you cite. But some of the most cited high-end estimates come from a book called The Black Book of Communism by Professor Stefan Courtois and others back in 1997. I don't have a copy, but there's actually a very good Wikipedia page that sums up the book, right? And we'll link to that. But their bottom line estimate is that communist regimes in the 20th century killed over 94 million people. 65 million in China, 20 million in the Soviet Union, 2 million in Cambodia, 2 million in North Korea, and on down the line. How did these deaths happen? Well, some were from systemic executions of political opponents and from purges of disfavored groups, but most were just from radical reshaping of the economy through things like famines. And let me give you some examples. Have you ever heard of China's Great Leap Forward? Right? Well, the Association for Asian Studies describes it this way. From 1960 to 1962, an estimated 30 million people died of starvation in China, more than any other single famine in recorded human history. More tragically, this disaster was largely preventable. The ironically titled Great Leap Forward was supposed to be the spectacular culmination of Mao Zedong's program for transforming China into a communist paradise. And it goes on to talk about how Mao basically decided that he wanted to leapfrog a couple of steps in development and become a major industrial power very quickly, while also becoming the most prominent sort of communist government in the world. And so just to be clear, right, this was China's Communist Party deciding it didn't want to be this agrarian country anymore. It wanted to move immediately, radically through a great leap forward to being an industrial power. And even though that was far too radical a plan to work, the state tried to force it to happen and 30 million people died, often in horrific fashion with things like parents having to decide which of their children to stop feeding and allow to die so that the others could survive. And to be clear, this was aimed, at least in theory, at a form of social justice. Mao wanted to make Chinese people better off and wealthier and less dependent on an agra a, a, a sort of backwards, he thought, agrarian style of life. It was viewed as making them better off economically, which is a socially just cause, right? So that's just one huge example of what happens when radicals take over, don't know what they're doing, and implement massive radical changes. We don't have time to go over even a tenth of the list of history's you know, revolutions, violent purges, and disastrously failed policies from radicals, but I strongly encourage you to do that research and make those kinds of arguments in your case as the neck. If you want a more quick example that's more recent, smaller in scale, but closer to home, look at the disaster that was the movement to defund the police, right? Defund the police, of course, was a slogan and a movement that gained a lot of traction in 2020 following the murder of George Floyd as a way to stop racial violence by police officers and other abuses. It was undeniably a radical position. There were plenty of proposals to reform the police or rein in the police, but the defund the police slogan and movement rested on the idea that policing was inherently unjust and racist, and so police departments had to essentially be eliminated, at least in their current form, and replaced with something completely different. So what was the result of that radical project? Well, if your goal was to actually achieve policy outcomes that reduce racial violence by police or police abuses generally in a sustainable way, then two years out, we can say pretty conclusively that defund the police was a disaster. And there's a good article from CNN in November 2021 explaining just how badly off the rails things were. Went. It talks about how Democrats now openly admit that defund the police was a counterproductive bad idea that produced a ton of backlash. The article gives a concrete example of how Minneapolis put a version of defunding the police as a public referendum on the ballot called Question 2 in November 2021, and it failed. It failed very decisively, 56 to 43, in one of the most progressive cities in America. And that really hurt the larger movement to reduce police violence. As CNN wrote, the the status quo affirming result is a setback to both citywide and national efforts to fundamentally reduce or eliminate the role of police in America. Opponents of calls to defund the police will point to the vote as fresh evidence that the backlash to police abuse that fueled last year's protest. Right? 
talk of curbing police departments by cutting or limiting their resources has run into a countervailing wall of concern over public safety and waning support from early allies, including leading Democrats, who largely view it as political poison. So the bottom line here is that by letting radicals rather than pragmatists and incrementalists drive the ship on police reform, progressives squandered a golden opportunity to actually make measurable progress on police violence and systemic racism. They let young, idealistic activists and protesters have their moment to vent their very justified anger and call for massive wholesale changes that were framed in a way, defund the police, that seemed almost designed intentionally to provoke division and outrage rather than building consensus. In short, they demanded all or nothing. And here again, the core problem with radicalism is when you insist on all or nothing, you usually get nothing. Or maybe you get even worse than that. You get backlash and you actually squander opportunities and lose the ground that you already had. And by the way, how does the project of defunding the police look today? Well, it looks real bad. Polls are terrible. A 2022 Politico poll found that 75% of Americans blame defund the police for an increase in violent crime. A March 2021 Ipsos poll found that only 18% of Americans support defund the police, including just 28% of black Americans and just 34% of Democrats. And look, you can find countless other examples of radical movements that fail and cause backlash, but the basic message is that this is the other major negative impact impact from radicalism. It's not just that the idea is disastrously bad in support of a generally good cause. That's the great leap forward. It's also potentially that the underlying idea is good, like reducing police abuse, but by letting radicals run the show, they will steer the boat into the rocks because they're more concerned with posturing than actually getting things done, and they will snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Okay, so finally, tip number 10, don't underestimate as the negative how effective incrementalism has been in improving people's lives. So lastly, I think the most important point in terms of going on offense for the neg is to emphasize just how much better the lives of marginalized people, poor people, and others are today because of incremental change, and more specifically, because leaders were willing to make deals that got some but not all of what they wanted rather than demand all at once, all or nothing, wholesale societal change. Now, the prerequisite to this argument, and this is the really important part, is that the negatives sell the judge on the idea that an incrementalist does not have to reject or disagree with big, ambitious, radical goals, particularly in the long term. What makes you an incrementalist is not whether you believe in big or small goals in the long run, it's your willingness to strike a deal and take what you can get right now, whatever that is, rather than digging your feet in and insisting on massive change all at once. And if you win that point, then pretty much every major social and economic victory of the last century becomes a victory for incrementalism. We almost never see change come by having people sit down and completely redraw the map of society and how it works in a day and then go out and tear it all down and rebuild it from scratch. In fact, the only places where we see those are places where we see things like, you know, communist revolutions, right? That's, that's the rare example of completely redrawing the map of society, right? That would be the argument, at least, for the negative. So if incrementalism is about accepting half here and a quarter there and a tenth there, right? Well, what are some of the examples of incrementalist victories for social justice? Well, we just start with the big one, right? The U.S. civil rights movement for black equality was a process that began really before the founding of the country because there, of course, were strong calls for the abolition of slavery even then. But if you just look at the time frame from about 1945 to 1970 that is considered traditionally the civil rights era, you will see that progress that happened was anything but all at once. It was absolutely a slow piecemeal process. Process. Ferris State University has a great timeline on the progress and the victories of this era, and I'd strongly suggest you look it over and be very, very familiar with it. But the basic gist is that it was an era of dozens of small victories, none of which achieved wholesale change. Eliminating whites-only primaries, desegregating the military, desegregating public schools, banning employment and discrimination, and on and on, right? None of these rooted out systemic racism in America, or even tried to do that. We still, of course, haven't done that, and we certainly couldn't have done it all at once in the 1960s. But through these small piecemeal victories, the lives of black Americans and in some cases other Americans of color became a lot less unfair. Still not fully just certainly, but closer to justice in say 1990 than they were in say 1940. 
And yes, it's true that leaders like Martin Luther King spoke out against, he called it the tranquilizing drug of gradualism and incrementalism. But in the real world, right, when push came to shove and they needed to show support for partial solutions like the Civil Rights Act of 1964, those leaders did that. And it's a good thing that they did that. And yes, of course, there were radical leaders during the Civil Rights era like Malcolm X, but they manifestly were not driving the ship. If they had been, right, there is a substantial chance that all the gains we saw might not have happened or certainly would have happened much later because it would have been a lot harder to build the coalitions of people of different races necessary to pass laws and implement real world reforms. And you can do this same kind of analysis with, for example, the movement for LGBTQ equality, which also has taken decades and is still very much a work in progress. You can do it with the movement for workers' rights, which dates back easily, at least, to the 19th century. You can do it with lots of things. The key, though, the key to the whole enterprise for the negative is selling the judge on the idea that no matter how fiery the public rhetoric is, a movement that is willing to bargain for and accept small victories rather than say like resorting to violent revolution is an incrementalist movement at its core and that these types of movements have won most if not nearly all of the victories for social justice. And once you sell the judge on that key distinction, you can credibly claim as the negative uh, the progress from all of these movements as impacts in your favor. So that is it. Those are the thoughts that kind of just occurred to me as we were getting ready on this topic, a little bit different from a regular video, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and I hope it was useful. So if you're headed to Louisville, I hope I see you there. Uh, come say hi if you see me. Uh, wish you, of course, the best of luck. If this is your last tournament of your high school career, I really hope the debate has been as amazing an experience for you as it was for me. And I hope Nationals is a great culmination of all your efforts. If you're coming back next year, I hope to see you on the channel. And remember, as always, debate is for everybody. So work hard, have fun, and hail state.